Good morning. Good morning. And a warm welcome to our worship today. Please take a moment now to welcome each other to God's house this morning.
take it off because they uh, want you to be relaxed. Maybe we could keep the door open just for a few moments as well, just to have some air circulate in the church as well. Thanks, Good morning, everyone. I've got a wee, wee, wee facts and a wee chat to have with you this morning. I know there's a smaller, smaller group. I'll give you one to come out. what was happening yesterday and what you were up to. What were you up to yesterday? Yeah. 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 And was it heading to the What was happening at that? What was that like? The was found. Yeah, did anyone see that? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to come around to you as well? I'm just facing this way. But make sure you're comfortable. Have a nice evening, you want, guys. Okay, I'll stand here. Is that better? Yes, I'll stand here. So the king got his crown. People saw that again. Do you watch that? What else happened? What else were you doing yesterday? What was that to? It was starting at the church. Oh, what was that? And what were you doing there? Planting plants and planting seeds. Hmm. Got some things I might talk about in that today. I was thinking about things we do and things you might do if you work for the king. Do you think the king has a lot of people around him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you see a lot of people yesterday? So many people behind him carrying the back of your ropes, was it? That's a big job, isn't it? Do you think there's lots of jobs? What kind of jobs do you think you have if you work for the king? Yeah? Cleaning the castle? Yes. That would take you a long time, wouldn't it? Longer than it takes you to clean your room. What do you think is a job? Making his dinner. Making his dinner? Like, do you think he makes his own dinner? No? A wee Tesco meal for one in the microwave? Do you think the king is that? Oh well. Oh well, I know. Well, I was thinking yesterday. What's it like to work for the king? What kind of jobs are there? So guess what it is? I googled. <laughs> Any jobs at the palace? And here it comes up, the palace website, just in case anyone's looking for a, a change of career or a wee bit extra. We something extra to do. There was eight jobs going at the palace. Eight jobs going. One of those jobs was to look after the horses. Another one of those jobs, and it's nearly clean in the palace, but it was to look after all the paintings in the palace and all of the objects. What do you think an object is? Huh? Oh, maybe we get some pieces that sit in the palace, maybe um, like little vases and things that hold flowers. Do you know how many of them are there? A million. <laughs> To look after a million objects in the palace. And another job was to help the visitors that come to the palace and show them around the palace. What job do you think you would like to do? Showing people around the palace? What, what do you think? Just the horses. I know, and I got me thinking, girl, you know, you can have a wee look at that yourself. If they're ever asking you at school what you want to do in the future, well, you might want a wee, a wee job in the palace and keep you busy, eh? Keep you busy. And I was thinking, well, what's it like to work for Jesus? You see, I have a, a niece and she's eight and she said to me the other day, Auntie Rona, I heard you work for Jesus. And I thought, well, actually, everyone that comes through this door of this church and everyone that believes in God, we all work for Jesus, don't we? And I thought, if you were writing a job description and you were Googling, what do you need to work for Jesus? I had a wee think of what that might say. Well, I'll tell you what I come up with. Right, okay. What did I come up with? I come up with, I think if you had a job for Jesus, I think you'd have to look after all the animals. So not just the horses like you look after in the palace. You'd have to look after the 
grow the animals and also all the plants. I felt like you were saying about what you were doing yesterday, plants and plants and plants and seeds. I think we need to look after all the earth, don't we, for life and for Jesus. And then I think, actually, we have to love people, don't we? That's our job. That's our job if we're working for Jesus, is to love each other and love people. And also to love God. I think those three things, if we can do those three things, then we can work for Jesus every day, can't we? I think so. I think so. Okay, well, I've got a wee prayer that just to say, to, to think about, and to think about serving and, and working for Jesus. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to be our Saviour and our friend. And thank you also that he is a king. Help us always to follow him and honour him and serve him and work for him in his kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, well, thanks very much for your answers. You were excellent at that. I think I told you to the same And we're not going to sing together next for mission phrase. The song's going to just this morning and it's 151. Let us come before God and pray. Let us pray. Eternal God, King of Kings, you are everywhere to be found, never hidden, always present. Open our eyes this morning to see your presence in the turning earth and the vast universe. In the rolling seas and the stretch of calm water, in the blossoms and the birds of spring, in the wildlife and even in the birds that we hear chirping outside. But Lord, we find you also in the joy of human friendships, in the thrust of birth and even in the quietness of death. You sit with us in the security of our family table, our food lovingly prepared, gladly shared. Lord, take away the veil that hides our eyes from you. 
Forgive the sin that darkens our sight of you. Heal the brokenness that shatters our picture of you. Renew the loyalty without which we lose our vision of you. And so in this moment of silence, in this place of prayer, we confess to you everything that creates a barrier between us and you. We are gathered here today to focus on your love. For your love for us comes gentle as a shower, healing our pain, binding our wounds. We give you thanks. Your love for us is sure as the dawn, transforming our darkness, revealing your truth. We give you thanks. Your love for us is mercifully steadfast, calling us to you, raising us up. We give you thanks. Your love for us encourages questions, is open to doubts, it makes us vulnerable. We give you thanks. Urge us on, O Christ and King, to find wholeness through serving you by serving others. This we pray in the power of your Spirit. As we pray together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today
Our first reading this morning is taken from the first letter to Peter, chapter 2, reading from verse 4, and you'll find this on page 295 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bible. Come to the Lord, the living stone rejected by man as worthless, but chosen by God as valuable. Come as living stones, and let yourselves be useful in building the spiritual temple, where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, I chose a valuable stone, which I am placing as a cornerstone in Zion, and whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. This stone is of great value for you, that for you that believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone which the builders reject as worthless turn out to be the most precious of all. And another scripture says, this is the stone that will make people stumble, the rock that will make them fall. They stumbled because they did not believe in the word. Such was God's will for them. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God, who called you out of the darkness into his own marvellous light. At one time, you were not God's people, but now you are his people. One time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received his mercy. And our second reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, reading from verse 13, and you'll find this on page 63. The question about paying taxes. Some Pharisees and some members of Herod's party were sent to Jesus to trap him with questions. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you tell the truth without worrying about what people think. You pay no attention to a man's status, but teach the truth about God's will for man. Tell us, is it against our law to pay taxes to the Roman Emperor? Should we pay them or not? But Jesus saw through their trick and answered, Why are you trying to trap me? Bring us some silver coin and let me see it. They brought him one and he asked, Whose face and name are these? The emperors, they answered. So Jesus said, Well then, Pay the emperor what belongs to the emperor, and pray to God, pay to God what belongs to God. And they were all amazed at Jesus. Amen. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. Thank you, Irene. Let's come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words of eternal life. Help us, Lord, to hear them, to receive them, and to live them out. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. His throne was a cross, his crown was made of thorns, his regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. If you were amongst the millions of people from all around the world watching the coronation, you would have heard those words from the Archbishop yesterday. 
It was a spectacular show. All the pomp and ceremony, from golden carriages to magnificent robes and crowns with precious jewels. But at the centre of proceedings, we had the humble Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, who led worship, bringing a relaxed solemnity to the proceedings. He was definitely God's man for the task. Justin has had many challenges in his own life, particularly in his younger years. His parents were both alcoholics and they split when he was only three years old. In 2016, he went public over the discovery that the man that he always thought was his biological father was not in fact. He told the complicated story, but in the end he said that although he had been shocked and there were issues arising from this that he would have to deal with, he was reassured in the knowledge that his real identity was found in Jesus Christ. It was this that defined the core of his being. His throne was a cross. His crown was made of thorns. His regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. Justin Welby came to faith in Christ when he was 19 as a student at Cambridge. And it was when he was praying that suddenly he felt a clear sense of something changing, the presence of something that had not been there before in his life. He said to his friend, please don't tell anyone about this. Welby said that he was desperately embarrassed that this had happened to him. In 2014 interview, Welby said that his conversion to Christ had come when his friend had taken him firstly to an evangelistic address which he found to be poor. Later that evening, his friend simply explained the Gospels to him. Welby said from that point on, he knew the presence of God. He has since said that his time at Cambridge was a major moment of self-realization in his life. The throne was a cross. His crown was made of thorns. His regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. And what a remarkable journey Justin Welby has had. And yesterday, he crowns the King of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. I believe that came over yesterday in the beautiful service at Westminster Abbey. What came over was his identity in Christ. In his own words, his throne was a cross. His crown was made of thorns. His regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. Identity. He identifies with this crucified Saviour. The guild motto, as we know in the Church of Scotland, whose we are and whom we serve. And that's what I heard yesterday in that service. A service which was grounded, yes, in tradition of hundreds and hundreds of years. Very symbolic, deeply spiritual. And one of the most moving parts yesterday was when the moderator of the Church of Scotland, Ian Greenshields, himself a man of great faith, not too dissimilar to Justin Welby, presented King Charles III with a King James Bible. A presentation has been part of every coronation service since 1689. And the King swears oaths to govern his people with justice and mercy and uphold the churches upon the Bible. And our moderator said to the king, Sir, 
to keep you ever mindful of the law and gospel of God as the rule for the whole life of government of Christian princes. Receive the book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. And the king placed his hand upon the Bible and took the coronation oath. Then at the very heart of the ceremony was the anointing of the king, which goes back to the anointing of King Solomon by Sadoc the priest and Nathan the prophet. In this symbolic act, which was shielded from our eyes, the king is literally stripped of all pomp and outward regalia, reminding us that the monarchy is essentially a call to service and in that we are reminded of Jesus, the servant king, who came not to be served, but to serve. His throne was a cross. His crown was made of thorns. His regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. We reflect on these words by singing together the hymn 374. From heaven you came, help this day, enter our world, we are glory healed. Three seven four. His throne was a cross. 
His crown was made of thorns. His regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. The people of Jesus' time were oppressed. And they wanted to know what Jesus' thoughts were on whom they should serve. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, refuses to collude with either the pro-Roman party Herodians in Jerusalem or indeed with those who were against Rome, the Pharisees. This question about whom they should pay their taxes to that we have read for us has deep underlying political motives. And it's a question that has resurfaced time and time again throughout history. Who do we pay our taxes to? Who do we serve? Where is our identity to be found? Do we identify with Caesar, the emperor, the king, or with God? And Jesus very wisely gives them an answer that they will never forget, and an answer that leaves them speechless. He asks them for a coin, a denarius, and asks them whose image, whose face is on the coin. Now any Jew worth their salt would know that they should not worship a graven image. And the very thought of worshipping Caesar would send a shiver down their spine. But this coin was a powerful symbol of their current political situation in that it daily reminded the Jews that they were someone else's property. It speaks of their identity. And their identity was with Rome, the Roman Empire. And the coin reminded them daily that they paid taxes to this oppressive government. And they thought for a brief moment that they had trapped Jesus. He was in a position where there was no wriggle room. And Jesus' answer to them was remarkable because it conserves both the civil and the religious powers of his day. He encouraged his people to give to Caesar what was his, and give to God what belonged to God. Yes, the coin had Caesar's image upon it, but you and me have God's image on us. The Bible teaches that we are created in God's image, and therefore we belong to God. First and foremost, our allegiance is always to God. The inevitable conclusion to this situation is this. If the state remains within its proper boundaries and makes its proper demands, the individual must give its loyalty and their service to it. We are called to serve the king of the land. But in the last analysis, both state and man belong to God. And therefore, to it, should their claims conflict, loyalty to God comes first. But it remains true that in all ordinary circumstances, a person's Christian faith should make them a better citizen, a citizen worthy of the kingdom of God. Today, I'm not here to invite you to swear loyalty to our earthly King Charles III, you were invited to do that yesterday, but I'm commissioned by God to invite you to swear allegiance to our heavenly King. Justin Welbin's opening words in his sermon was this, we are here to crown a King and we crown a King to serve. There is King Charles's identity. There is Justin Welby's identity. There is Ian Greenshield's identity. And every other Christian since Jesus uttered the words, come and follow me, 
His throne was a cross. His crown was made of thorns. His regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. Let me conclude now in our reading from 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter reminds his readers about their identity. You are a chosen people. You are the king's priest, or in other versions, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And in those few words from Peter, the apostle and disciple, we discover our identity in Christ. We are royalty in God's eyes. When we follow Jesus on the path of service, we are considered to be a royal priesthood, the king's priests. And we are seen to be priests doing the work of God by serving others. Archbishop Justin Welby, a remarkable man, but he is a human like us all. And no doubt he has many failings. And yet in Jesus Christ, he has found his home, his identity. His throne was a cross. His crown was made of thorns. His regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. Where is my identity? Where is your identity today? May we find it in our servant king. Amen. Father, worship God, our hymn is 502. Take my life, Lord, let it be consecrated, glad and free. 502.
uns Herr empfehlen. Lord, you hold the earth in your hands and you're closer to us than the air that we breathe. Fill our souls with your wonderful love and your light and majesty. Guide us, Lord, to use our gifts for the church and accept our gifts today for the work of your church in our community. Remind us, Lord, that in Christ we are one body with many members. Help us to remember that every member has individual gifts according to your grace. May our church be all that you would have it to be. Help us to be aware of your presence each and every day. Make us instruments and servants of you with love and with praise. Give us strength and courage to reflect you in the world. And hear us today as we pray for those in the world. For those in a world often too darkened by terror and pain and suffering, from combat, from conflict and from disruption of the economy across the world. And we think today as this week the World Health Organization declared the end of the COVID-19 as an emergency. Lord, we come to you as we think of those pained and impacted by the virus. As we think about the disruption and the grief that it has caused. And we pray, Lord, for your peace and for your love to come in and heal the scars that it has left. And we continue to pray for those in our health and care sectors across the world who relentlessly work to protect people from still existing on current levels of this virus and of other life-impacting diseases. We think also this morning of those close to us who need your strength, who need your compassion and need your love at this time and we bring them before you now. Lord, we know that your everlasting light shines in us in moments of great sadness and in moments of great joy. Particularly then in great joy, Lord, we're grateful for yesterday, the time of the King's coronation here on earth. And as we remember that ceremony, we think about ceremonies that have taken place in this church, baptisms, weddings, and we think of all those who have been blessed by you through those ceremonies. And we ask you to be with them in their lives, wherever they are at this time. We pray that they would be close to you, come back to you, for you to be in them, in them, in you. And we think about the ceremony next week, our girls and boys, Brigade ceremony, and we pray for the children. We pray as they think about preparing for next Sunday, and we pray for the leaders as well. Bless them this week as they look forward to coming into the church that Sunday, and we pray that it will be meaningful for them. And of course, we think about the King and his role his role to serve you and our country. And we think of those leaders across the world set up to serve. And we pray that their hearts and minds be open to your spirit so that your love can reign. And we ask this of the forever King Jesus. Amen. We will now sing together hymn number 458, at the name of Jesus.
Lord save the King. So the blessing. All praise and thanks to God who reigns in highest heaven, the Father and the Son, the Spirit now be given, the one eternal God whom earth and heaven adore, for thus it was, is now, and shall be evermore. Go now in God's peace to love and to serve others. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore.